Michael Connolly. Welcome to Booktopia. Thanks for having me on. Now, you've been a crime reporter. You've sold 58 million crime novels. You've looked into the, the minds of the good and the bad. Are you able to get away with the perfect murder? Um, I don't think so. I think, I mean, you know, first of all, people get away with murder. I know that. Uh, in Los Angeles alone, the clearance rate is under 75%. So at least one out of every four killers gets away with it. But I also, through my research and everything, feel that the chances of that happening are really slim. It takes some kind of lucky thing that happened. But I, th I think someone planning the perfect murder, uh, I wouldn't want to risk it. No, no. I mean, especially when you've got someone like Harry Bosch on your on your tail, and yeah. up all, especially with the, the new technology as well, things coming through. Um, I've been um, wondering about this this duality that's in in your writing. You've got Mickey Haller, who is talkative, you know, is, is sharp as a, and you've got um, Harry Bosch, who is more of the strong, silent type. Are they two parts of you? Those two different characters. No, I don't think so. I mean, um, I think Harry Bosch and I have a lot in common. Um, the way we look at the world, the way we would rather say nothing than say a lot. And uh, Mickey Holler is not uh, really drawn from me. He's drawn from a character I know, a lawyer that I know, who kind of inspired him. And uh, he's a guy who has an answer for everything, has a story for everything, and that talks too much. Um, I've toned that back some for Mickey. But but that's where that comes from. It doesn't. It's not like I'm not writing about flip sides of my own personality when it comes to him. So this friend, he, he doesn't look over his shoulder in a cafe. And go, Michael, just just move a couple of tables away. I don't, you don't need to write down everything I say, buddy. No, I think he is uh, um, enjoys the uh, notoriety. Um, he's kind of known as the Lincoln lawyer, the guy who inspired it. Um, he was, uh, when they made a film of that book, um, uh, McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey, who played the character, wanted to meet, he, he was smart enough to know that um, I must have researched this book, I must have spent time with lawyers, I want to meet those lawyers, and so this main guy and another lawyer I spent time with, I was br brought them to the set, and McConaughey uh, asked them questions and things like that, so all that has, I think, improved his life. <laughs> and you, um, when you're looking at uh, the police procedural stuff, that you've, you've been a crime reporter for, for, for 15 years before you went into um, right. novel writing, that stuff would probably come more naturally to you than the, than the, than the court stuff? Is, that, is it like one that sort of comes out of you from your, your, your natural being and the other one is something you research? Yeah, that's exactly right. I, um, a Lincoln Lawyer book takes me more time because I do have to break away from writing and actually have significant research. The cop stuff takes research, but I'm, uh, I guess because I was a reporter, because I know so many cops, I've hung around with them. Those are the, uh, the Harry Bosch books I can kind of start writing and shoot off emails here and there as I go to make sure I have things right. But that's more of a, there's more momentum, it's more of an always writing type process. For a Lincoln lawyer, there's, there's non-writing times where I'm asking questions and getting answers. Now, um, Harry Bosch, yeah, this is... Coming up, The Crossing is going to be the 20th novel? Is that the um, I lose count. Yeah, 19 or 20. I mean, <laughs> he's in a few and he's not in some, so yeah, that sounds like a good number. Um, when it, somewhere along the line, he just, he just quits, and I wondered whether or not he quits the police force, and I'm wondering whether or not, you know, why, why that just didn't happen, then why he actually re-entered the police force. So, yeah. um, you know, it's funny, I look back at that and feel like that was one of the false moves I made, uh, sort of a mistake. And it doesn't show up in the writing because I wrote two books when he wasn't a cop and he was like a private eye. And I like those books a lot. They're a couple of my favorites, actually. But what happened was I realized uh, he quit at the end of City of Bones and it was seemed like the right character move to make, that he was fed up, that the bureaucracy was too um, crushing and that he was going to split. And he split. And then I wrote a couple of books where he's a private eye. And what I found when I was writing them was that I had lost something, and that was that bureaucracy and the politics of the police department and how Harry um, makes his way through all those obstacles. And that was a way of delineating his character, and I, th I think that was a way of him connecting with readers, and that's one of the reasons they liked him, because everyone has to deal with bureaucracy, and they admire a guy who just like blows through it or knocks things down or just does not accept it. 
Um, and I felt that was missing. And at the same time, you know, I always try to be realistic in my books. At the same time, um, a new police chief took over in the Los Angeles Police Department, and he actively started recruiting detectives who had retired back. Because when he assessed the department, he said, we've lost a lot of good people. There was a lot of controversies and scandals, and, and the, the department had a um, bad reputation at that. It had a low point of reputation, and a lot of good people left or they left and got jobs at other uh, police agencies and so forth. And so a program was started to bring them back, a realistic program. And that kind of fell, fell right into my lap, and I felt like, okay, I'll have Harry come back in um, this um, this way, this uh, legitimate way, and then I'll have go have back. I'll have what I was missing back. Yeah, well, it was same very um, handy bit of real life coming to assist to assist yeah. an author. Uh, I'm sure he didn't manipulate that in any way to get that to happen for you. Um, now, when I've been selling books for twenty years, and one of the one of my earliest um, easy sells was was the, the, the poet. Uh, I remember that being a breakout novel for, for you, and I used to stock it on my shelf, and it was one of those things when people were looking around, and I was trying to ease people into getting back into fiction. I would go, this is your, this is your book. Um, I know that you've said that in, in times I've, I've read articles where you've said that's you know, kind of one of your favourite novels in, when you're going through. Um, can, uh, I mean, when selling a book, when you open a book and it's got that, that first line, that you can just show him and go, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. how, how important is that first page for a writer? Um, I think it's, it's really important. I, I don't know if you should say like just the first page, but you have to, you know, it's a busy world. People have a lot of different competing things for their, their, the time they can spend in pure entertainment. And uh, so you have, and when you write a book, you, you, you know, someone's ready to make a commitment and you got to repay that, and you have to connect with them pretty quick. I don't know if you have to do it in the first page or the first line, but the sooner the better. And, um, and you know, that, when I write books, and especially when I'm writing the first chapter, so that, that's very, very uh, prevalent in my mind. How, am I making a connection? And, uh, um, you know, that one seemed to work pretty good for me. Yeah, death is my beat. I make my living from it. And just... <laughs> awesome to opening line. It's uh, funny that was a battle. I had a battle on that with my editor. Didn't like the first line. That's something that the writers love to love to hear. <laughs> yeah, that that one, buddy. <laughs> well, that was my um, fifth book, and and I was beginning to feel I could win. Not that I have a bad relationship with my editor. He's now actually the publisher, um, and he he was right on so many different things. But I always give him a hard time about death is my beat because. Uh, he didn't think. He thought it was too uh, too much of a throwback, too pulpy, uh, yeah. and I wanted to stick with it. You know, it was very autobiographical. It was the way I felt about my life when I was a newspaper reporter. Um, that whole first paragraph really summed up, I thought, accurately the life I had lived. And so it was one of the first times I made a stand. Said, "No, I have to keep it." And then at one point. Um, in an essay or a column or something, Stephen King wrote that he loved the first line of that book, and so I was like, "I won this one." <laughs> I was right. So. You can get a little plaque made. So when I, I always, I still to this day, I mean, man, that book's like twenty years old or something. Um, I still give my editor, a now publisher, a hard time about it. Michael Connolly, thank you very much for talking with us. Sure, thank you. All of Michael's books are available from Booktopia.com.au right now.